Hello and welcome. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining the, the stream. Uh, right, we're going, we are actually live. My name is Sazam. Hello from IT Arena. IT Arena, uh, Arena welcomes you. Before we start, there is an air ride siren going on in, in Lviv. So we would like to, would like to make sure that, you know, you do, you, you take all the necessary precautions uh, when it comes to safety for those of us who are joining us from Ukraine. The rest, you're welcome. Uh, into uh, following the invasion and the callous, brutal, unprovoked, inhumane war that Russia is waging in Ukraine, uh, we decided to here in IT uh, in IT arena to host this uh, bi-weekly talks with industry leaders because international support for Ukraine has been at unprecedented levels but we are particularly interested in the tech industry. For that, we'll have this new live talk format where we will be um, having tech leaders over. Your questions are always welcome. We'll pick some of the interesting ones at the end and ask our uh, guests today. Without further ado, I'm going to uh, you know, yield the virtual stage to Mr. Mike Butcher, who is an editor at large at, of TechCrunch. He has written for UK, international, uh, UK national newspapers and magazines, and actually been named one of the most influential people in European technology by Wired UK. Uh, Mike, over to you. All right. So Mike, Mike's going to connect in a moment. All right. So I do remind you uh, to take uh, uh, to ask questions in the chat. So over to Mr. The large for tech crunch. Oh. Hello, my name is Mike Bush. I'm the editor at large for Tech Crunch. I'm normally based out of London, but today I'm coming to you live from Latvia uh, from the Tech Chill Conference. And it's my uh, pleasure to uh, introduce a great panel. We'll be unpacking uh, for the next uh, hour about uh, technology startups, Ukraine, um, what's going on, stories from the field. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's great for you to join. And we would definitely like you to uh, be part of the Q&A uh, which I think is going to be run uh, by our, our fantastic organisers. Um, let me introduce our panel. We have Andrew Brown, CEO of EduNav, which develops technologies for colleges and universities. Andrew has grown scale technology businesses, including startups, middle market and large, large scale public companies, and has a long history uh, as an executive entrepreneur and advisor. We also have John Sun Kim, who's a chief executive who created the companies Dr. and Gerardly. Uh, JetBrain connects startups to Eastern European technology, technology talent and has raised uh, over a million funding. And we also have Andy Kurtzig, who's the founder and CEO of Just Answer. He started Just Answer in 2003 and spent the first two and a half years programming the website and listening to users. JustAnswer.com is the largest Q&A website that connects people to real qualified experts and has raised $50 million in uh, venture capital backing. Uh, gentlemen, uh, I apologize in advance for the slight lack of diversity or, or some level of diversity, but we've got, uh, we have some level of diversity, um, not gender diversity, alas, but, um, First of all, I think what we need to unpack a little bit is uh, let's hear from in turn each of our panelists about firstly what their companies do briefly, obviously, and then let's hear let's hear about what they uh, their interactions in Ukraine, whether or not they they have teams there there and and how their their personal story, stories are evolving during this obviously. Uh, extremely difficult time. Perhaps if I could uh, turn to uh, you, first of all, Andrew Brown, President CEO of EduNav. Andrew, um, I know that you're based in San Francisco, and you, but you also have significant teams in Ukraine. Um, let's hear a little bit about what you guys do, obviously, and then let's hear about you know what's happening with your company at this time. Sure. Thank you, um, introduction. Thanks for the, the host to 
setting up this opportunity to talk with everyone, um, obviously through a challenging time, but something that we're all making best use of in, in every way possible. Um, so Edunav is a technology company. Um, we sort of have a, a, a broad mission to create a world where all backgrounds have expanded access to economic and social opportunities in higher education. Um, so we're focused on technology products that help institutions, colleges, and universities kind of be better informed about decision-making and then lead to improved student outcomes. And so we have a suite of SaaS products um, that we sell to the institution and the institutions we sell to are community colleges, which are two-year schools in the United States and then four-year schools. And our customers range in size from just a few thousand students up to many tens of thousands of students. Um, the company was founded um, seven or eight years ago and actually has a, a, a very rich um, Ukraine backbone. Um, the, the founder of the company um, had a history of starting businesses in Ukraine and then started Edunev um, from, that, from that history. And there are many reasons why we did that. Um, firstly, there was a personal connection there with the founder, but mostly because of the very strong technical talent. Um, you know, 250,000 technical specialists in Ukraine. It's got a very rich and deep academic um, backbone to the organization, to the, to the country. Um, and, and that's enabled a, a very rich kind of talent base, which Edunav is drawn upon. Um, I would say that the way we've worked with Ukraine over the last few years has been to, again, have the Ukrainian team at the cornerstone of our technical team. Um, we're not using this to kind of use it as an outsourcing function. We're using this to actually build products and develop products. Um, and multiple reasons for that. One is talent. One is kind of the, the, the hard work and resilience that we've all seen now, um, especially over the last few months. Um, there's a cost benefit. Um, but, but I think above all, it's, you know, we've, we've created kind of this relationship base between the US in our case and then Ukraine. And then we've got some resources in other countries as well. Um, and we think of this as a one team company. And so we're not working with Ukraine as kind of an offshoot of a business. We're working with Ukraine and US as one team. And every piece of my company's fabric is about creating harmony and integration between our Ukrainian team members and colleagues and our US team members and colleagues and creating that as one company in Edgenev. Um, and then I think just from my time in the company, I've been in the company for three years, I've grown to be kind of especially attached to the people in the organization we have there. Um, respect them for their talent, their hard work, dedication. And I think obviously as we've gone through the last 60 something days now um, with the build up the last 60 something days, that's actually just made that bond even stronger. Um, and what I've seen in the last 60 days is extraordinary fortitude, obviously not just at a national level that we all read in the news and all we hear in the news, but also with the team members that we have um, in maintaining business continuity. So in, in the way I've approached kind of the, the conflict over the last two or three months is, you know, it's people safety first. Um, that's absolutely paramount in making sure that everyone is safe. But then secondly, from a fiduciary responsibility from a business standpoint, I have to maintain business continuity. And so we've done that through a number of tactics and we can go into those kind of as we kind of explore this conversation today. Um, but above all, you know, our, our commitment to our team there and to the country is, is extremely robust, strong and passionate. And we only expect to see continued growth for our company in the country of Ukraine. Thank you, Andrew. That's um, a great overview. And I think uh, definitely uh, setting the tone, I think, uh, for the conversation around uh, talking about uh, our colleagues and uh, friends in Ukraine as definitely as one team. I, I totally concur with that. Um, uh, and uh, uh, to John, John Sung Kim, perhaps if I can turn to you next, um, Give us a, a you know an overview of uh, JetBridge. Um, love to hear about that, and tell us a little bit more about you. You're you, you're quite uh, well versed, and I'm afraid you and I, in actual fact, uh, met in, in Ukraine a few years ago, and you've obviously um, not only fell in love with the country, but you have a, you also uh, um, uh, you also have a, a great affinity with the country uh, for obvious reasons, which I'm sure you're going to tell us about. Um, but yeah, tell, tell us a little bit about JetBridge and uh, you know what's what it's doing uh, and its relationship with Ukraine. Sure, Mike. Um, <clears throat> by the way, I used to throw these house parties in San Francisco where Mike would come over, he would show up and start playing one of my guitars. 
Um, also, he's quite deft with the soccer ball, which I also had lying around. Um, but yeah, you know, I started a couple of SaaS companies in San Francisco, and I felt, you know, over 23 years, I kind of checked most of the tech bro boxes. Um, and so when some of my engineers from San Francisco and I took a holiday through Ukraine, we loved it so much. Um, I met my wife, who's Ukrainian, my CTO, uh, he's married to a Ukrainian. And uh, we needed an excuse to stay past six months. So we started a software outsourcing company that competes with the likes of EPAM. I think our major difference is twofold. One, our company is owned by the developers. So the developers that work at JetBridge, they work for our clients, but they own a piece of the company. Uh, and then two, we take our profits and we invest in other startups. So our developers kind of get to act like hobby angel investors. And uh, it's been a great model. We've had over a couple of dozen developers that have um, stayed with us through our three-year journey. Um, half of them are now out, mostly to Poland. Uh, obviously, men can't leave. So that's left uh, about a dozen men and a couple of women still in Ukraine. And um, you know, I totally agree with Andrew. Safety is number one. Um, you know, I think the thing that's come out of this is, I would say three months ago, I totally agreed with Brian Armstrong at Coinbase that employees are a sports team and not families. Um, but now I think because of this crisis, we've come into the converse of that, which is our Ukrainian employees are our work family. And so again, going back to what Andrew said, safety is number one, which means our business has had to take a back seat. Um, I think the thing, and I would love to hear Andy and Andrew's um, uh, kind of perspective of what they're seeing on a street level. But the thing that concerns me is that what we're seeing from Western clients is that with one hand, they're saying, I support Ukraine, like stand with Ukraine, Slava Ukraini. But with the other hand, they're saying, how the, how do we get the F out of this country? That, which includes Belarus and Russia. Um, because one, we can't have our data sitting there. And two, um, we've got deadlines, right? Um, so that's, that's my kind of principal concern as far as the war is affecting the IT folks. Everyone's alive. Um, everyone's in good health. They have electricity, internet, food. Um, my deeper midterm and long-term concern is, are the Western clients going to start pulling out um, because of this instability? Right. Yes. That's, uh, that, uh, let's, um, I, I want to unpack that a little bit more uh, in a minute, I, especially as you say, the, I think it's worth talking about the long-term effects of, of what's going to be happening and where we're all going to be able to sit on that. Um, uh, I'm sure you guys are all committed to the country, but of course um, there's lots of other companies and uh, clients, customers and, uh, and partners who will, will need reassuring longer term. Um, that's, that's, that's definitely, let's come back to that. But then finally, uh, let's also hear now from uh, Andy Kurtzig from Just Answer. Um, uh, Andy, same question to you. Let's hear from you about... Uh, uh, your relationship with the country and uh, and uh, obviously what you're what you're doing and what, where things are right now with you guys. Of course. So Andy Kurtzig, CEO of Just Answer, and we are the largest Q and A platform connecting consumers with experts live, real time. So if you want to talk to a doctor about your hurt foot, or a mechanic about your broken car, or a lawyer about an immigration issue, we've got experts connecting to, with consumers real time, all day, every day. We've been in Ukraine since 2010, seen a lot there. Um, and I'll just start off the call by saying we are committed to Ukraine. We love Ukraine. We are staying in Ukraine and we're growing in Ukraine. So even since the war started, we've hired more than 10 people in Ukraine. We've got 200 and now 262 plus people in Ukraine out of a thousand people globally. And my family and I were just there. Uh, we spent our spring break uh, at the Ukrainian border, and I crossed into Ukraine to bring a bunch of supplies and, and help out in Ukraine just uh, a week and a half ago. My family stayed on the, uh, the EU side and helped out at a refugee center, and we brought notes from the children of California to the refugees and 
and brought medical supplies to the to the to the to the you know to some of our folks that have volunteered to go and and and, and help uh, in the war zones to help with the injured, both civilians and troops, and then we brought safety supplies to the folks on our staff that have volunteered or been drafted into the military, body armor, night vision goggles, range finders, drones, et cetera. And uh, we were there. I was there during an air raid siren. I know there's an air raid siren there now as well. And I'll just, I'll just close by saying, you know, the world has gotten the message, boycott Russia, don't buy Russian things. But I think it's just as important to buy Ukrainian not just products, but also services. And so we're hiring in Ukraine and we're committed to continue to hire in Ukraine to support the Ukrainian government, to support the Ukrainian economy and, and help Ukraine win. Thank you, Andy. A very good message there. Yeah, buy Ukraine. Um, I think that um, as the war uh, progresses and for obvious reasons, uh, people's attention span uh, wanes, uh, it's definitely we're getting the message out that Ukraine's business community is still up and running despite everything and especially the tech community is still up and running here we are talking about it so uh, that's a fantastic message to, to get across um it's an open question right now and i'd love for anyone to sort of jump in on this um uh, words about some uh, the aren't the people uh, mentioned uh, earlier, I think John and, and uh, uh, are there any other things going on? People are still being able to work. And then what's the split between uh, the tech community that's still able to kind of carry on, you know, carry on, uh, keep keeping the lights on and running, running businesses. And also the split between, you know, are any of your teams affected by, uh, you know, having to, I don't know, pick up a, a Kalishnikov and go and go to the front line or, you know, uh, let's hear a little bit about that as well. There's, there's that aspect going on together. Sorry, could you repeat the first part of the first question because you cut out? Oh, I'm very sorry. Yeah, okay. um, briefly, um, to summarise, uh, the uh, what's the split between um, keeping your teams going keeping yeah. the lights on running the businesses and those of you some some aspects i presume some some of your teams have actually peeled off and they've had to go get involved in the in the actual war scenario um, yeah. uh, um who, who 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 can talk to that piece i mean i'll i'll, I'll start and i'm sure um the others will all chime in so so for our organized for, for Reginav, we've um our team have not gone to war per se um but obviously in a country that's at war, they're at war every day, whether they're on Zoom calls with clients in the United States, um, writing code or having internal meetings. And so, I mean, 24 seven for anyone in the country, whether they're on the front lines or whether they're sitting in an office building, they're constantly at war with the pressures and stress and concerns of that. And that weighs on people emotionally and, and over time now, certainly very physically because of sleep deprivation, air raid sun going off, sirens, um, stresses of family, friends or, or colleagues or otherwise or for themselves. Um, and so there is a productivity here, um, but I've still been spectacularly impressed with how hard people are working despite the productivity here and all the things that everyone's worried about. Um, but for our team, you know, people are involved maybe in the refugee efforts because they're based in Lviv, where a lot of refugees go by. So many of the team are helping out in various ways, um, but not directly on the front line in any way. We haven't seen any of that. We've had a few people move overseas, I'm sorry, to Poland. Um, but mostly it's sort of business as usual at some level um, in a way that I would never have predicted. And I've been, again, extremely impressed. Um, I do want to go back to something that was said by the others, kind of um, the, the conversation about kind of, and I think this is a very important conversation for kind of Ukraine and how this impacts overseas investment in the country. Um, because there have been wobbly moments over the last couple of months where you think, gosh, there could be a collapse of overseas investment for some reason because of what could happen in the country. 
Um, I actually now have built an extremely positive and upbeat perspective on sort of an, an almost an opposite view of that, which is there's now an extraordinary spotlight on this incredible country and the world is in awe at the resilience of the people there and what they stand for and how they're applying themselves to defend this invasion. Um, and then more generally, there's now a spotlight as well in, in the world that we're in, in terms of technical talent and appreciation for what they can do of all the different overseas com companies that are involved. And I think there's a, there could easily be some kind of momentum build where there's a combination of sympathy and or doing things that are just, just for themselves, plus also a spotlight on the talent that creates an opportunity. And if that can be mobilized, um, once we get through whatever period we're in now, there could be quite a surge of interest and investment in this country. And I think that it's up to people like us in combination with the Ukrainian people and people in the Ukrainian government to build that support and make sure that that is in fact something that happens um, because people could get bored with the news, right? And after the conflict is over, whatever that means, or at least it's waned, um, things could be very different. But I think it's up to us now to kind of build on the momentum and, and build real excitement in this country for all the good reasons that we've all invested in there and work out how to get the country in a better place from an economic investment standpoint and, and build on the momentum of what we achieved. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you, Andrew. That was actually a fantastically upbeat point. Um, I'm glad, glad you made that, uh, despite the fact that uh, I've, I've read recently that it'll cost a, about $600 billion to... Uh, to, to rebuild many of the aspects of, of Ukraine's uh, country and, and its infrastructure. But there's clear the talent and the and the, the people have been so utterly incredibly impressive over the last few months that uh, I think that the opportunities in the country are just, you know, just incredible. So thank you for bringing us back to that. And I want to I want to return to that subject. Andy, okay. perhaps uh, perhaps um, uh, uh, just answer, you know, tell us a little about you know, the split your teams and uh, is where is everybody is it, um, and and have you managed uh, as a company, you know, is, um, has affected people in terms of the actual war effort as well? Of course, as I'll start off by saying in response to Andrew, why wait? We're already doing it. We're hiring. We're growing. Let's start now supporting the economy and not waiting until the war is over, whenever that might be, um, you know. We're, we're eager to support and help uh, Ukraine in any way we can. And that's one of the, the, the best things we can do as business leaders is invest in Ukraine now at their time of, of greatest need, not after the war is over. So uh, in terms of people, we've got four people that have either volunteered or been drafted into the military. We uh, have a policy of paying half their salaries while they're, they're, they're serving their country and then guaranteeing their jobs when they come back. That's half of their salary, their just answer salary, in addition to the salary they get for serving in the military. So that's how we've dealt with that. Um, we've got uh, you know, another person just got drafted as well. Um, and uh, we're doing everything we can to, to, to set them up for as much safety as possible, including, like I mentioned, bringing body armor and drones and, and night vision goggles and things like that to our team in Ukraine. We've got some pictures of those if you want to share uh, at some point uh, on this. But but uh, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a difficult situation and everybody's got a different way of dealing with it. Some people were the first ones to volunteer and I, I'm sure you remember that first couple of days when the war started, all the traffic heading west and then you see that one car heading east Right, that was that was one of our folks heading straight to the to the war zone to go help and volunteer and serve their country, and you know we're proud to be able to support Ukraine and, and honored to be able to help them win this battle against uh, the, the terrible atrocities that, that Putin and, and Russia are committing against Ukraine. So, uh, yeah, yeah, great. Andy, thank you very much. This is quite an inspiring picture there you paint. That's uh, incredible, John. Um, uh, and what's what story, John? What sort of stories have you heard, and what sort of what are things you, your teams have, have been up to? Um, you know, and, and has, have the, have you had similar scenarios with uh, with what's happening with you, your teams? Yeah, when the war first broke out, I would say we were at 
50% productivity, then it kind of went to 80% productivity, then people got used to the air raids and the sirens. Um, you know, I've had more than a few developers tell me that work is the quote, only thing keeping them sane. Um, so I think we're, we're both grateful for that. Um, none of our clients have left. However, I do know um, through a friend that one of the very large multinational travel booking sites has given their Ukrainian employees until May 24th to figure out a way to leave the country. Again, most developers are, um, and I don't like this, but hopefully this is changing, men. So to give them till May 24th to leave or they lose their jobs, I was, I was really disappointed about that. I think we need more people to be like Andrew and Andy. And um, uh, that, that's, you know, especially what, what you did, Andy, going to the border and going into Ukraine. That's amazing. Um, thank you for that. Um, you know, I did hear one of our front end developers say that he joined the militia early on in Kyiv and they were taking turns holding the rifle which gave me like flashbacks of enemy at the gates. Um, but he recently told me he left the militia because Kiev is like, it's set. They have enough people, the people have enough arms. Um, so we've been grateful that there's been, at least in Kiev, um, there's been a sense of normalcy returning to, to work functions. Um, we, we hope that that continues, you know, I mean, selfishly, Kiev is my city. So I, you know, I, I hope they, uh, they're, they're bear the burden of the next phase of the war, whatever that may be. Right. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that sort of snapshot of what's going on amongst your, your companies and, uh, and your teams. I guess it's, it's time now to sort of let's go to more familiar territory, which we're uh, probably in in the normal sort of technology industry conversations, uh, are, are, are things are like the co external conversations that we're having with uh, clients or with investors, I think it also is an interesting one to maybe unpack. Um, what are some of the things that you guys are hearing and how are you sort of externally talking about this situation to uh, clients, investors, partners, and what sort of feedback are you getting from the outside, you know, the, the world outside of Ukraine? Um, and are, are you having to kind of, for instance, uh, set people right on how, how they view what's going on? Um, uh, what are the kind, and, and also, you know, what are the kinds of feedback you're getting from, from those external conversations um, with, say, sort of Western companies or investors or companies in the US? Um, uh, Andy, uh, Andrew Brown, let's hear from you on that. So. <laughs> That's a very good question or topic, um, and it is something we've been grappling with for a couple of months now. Um, and there's, there's different stakeholders you brought up, and the, the communications are very different. So, I mean, the first set of stakeholders are our customers and partners, and our customers and partners are institutions, colleges, universities in the United States, some very big brand names, um, some lesser known schools. and. The conversation with those groups has gone on sort of two different dimensions. Um, one is the sort of care and compassion. Um, our software is extremely mission critical to the work that they do. We're used by their students and we're used by their advisors, counselors, and administration in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in core parts of the, the work that they do. And so in the work that we've done, we build very close relationships with our partners from the president on down in the institution. Um, and typically we touch many, many dozens, if not hundreds, and certainly thousands of students. Um, and as a company that's both small and nimble, but then also has scaled and can now serve many customers, um, they've grown quite fond and attached to our people who they interact with very often. And so the, the, the first wave of communications was, how are your team doing? What's going on? Is anyone hurt? Um, and that's been very reassuring for us because it shows that they're quote unquote on our side and have been highly supportive of our people and our company. Um, and it's been extremely kind of rewarding for our team in Ukraine to hear what our customers say and how they think about them because it comes from a, a place of compassion and care, both of them as an individual and then obviously from a, from a national standpoint as well. Um, but the conversation naturally does turn to, is any of our data or is any of our service at risk? Right, um, because at the end of the day, we 
are critical to, for example, student registration in an institution. If registration goes down, they may not get enrollment dollars, right? So we have to remain in business and we have to maintain business continuity. So we've both developed a, a, a very rich continuity plan, which we had in place prior to the conflict, but we vamped um, significantly um, through the last three months. Um, and we have a business continuity plan that will maintain service levels in any scenario, um, whether it's at the extreme end of our Ukrainian business goes away for whatever reason, all the way to the conflict will be 100% resolved. And then thinking through every single scenario of financial system down, internet down, and so on. Um, full Russian occupation of Ukraine. Um, and so we have business continuity plan. And so we've built that in extreme detail and shared that with our customers that um, have an interest. Um, and that's given everyone peace of mind. So that's the two sort of communication levels with um, customers and partners. Um, and then on the investor front, it is, it is a tougher conversation. Um, and we have two sets of investors. We have investors that are investing in us today. Um, and we have investors that we would like to bring on board. The investors we would like to bring aboard, it's a harder conversation because they have choices. They can invest in a company like ours that has some level of dependence on Ukraine, or they can invest in someone who doesn't have dependence on Ukraine. And all things equal, they're going to prefer the latter. And that's still somewhat the case. I think the last half of the conflict, that problem is getting smaller as there's a perceived survival strategy for the country, definitely, but then also for our business operations, which are in Western Ukraine. And so both our business continuity plan and our communication talk track around that has shifted over the last 30, 40 days, where now there's a sense that, okay, business continuity is not a risk. What's a bigger risk for you is that you're an early stage startup and all the risks associated with that. That's still a bigger risk for our business. Um, and so that conversation is getting easier. And I fully anticipate that conversation to not be a problem over the coming months as we see even further progress in the conflict. Um, and then I'd also sort of overlay a, a third kind of message, which is, you know, there's lots of misunderstanding about Ukraine as a country, the relationship with Russia. So there's a whole education process going on with any stakeholder we're talking to about almost the history of the country, what this means, why it's happening, and why and how we think Ukraine will survive and be a great country now and will continue to be a great country and a great place to put employees. And so there's a, there's a very broad set of communications there that we make um, almost on a daily basis and I make with different stakeholders. Um, but as I said, I think that the macro point is we're getting through this problem by really thinking carefully and strategically about the communication and mitigating the risks and minimizing the impact on our business. There was a shaky period, you know, two months ago, but I think we're getting through that now and hopefully that will continue. Fantastic. Thank, thank you. Um, John, uh, perhaps you could uh, talk about the conversations you're having externally, you're having to do a lot of education about uh, Ukraine and, uh, you know, handholding of uh, clients, partners, etc. You know, I sent an email update to my investors saying that we're going to see significant headwinds in our business plans and, and revenue targets this year, which we're going to miss um, because of this war. And uh, all my investors, um, starting with shout out to David Weisberg at 10X Capital, he emailed me right away and said, this is all he said. Thank you for everything you're doing for Ukraine didn't mention anything about us missing our internal target. Like that was it. And all of our investors have been of the same, you know, type of response. Like everything is about, are the employees okay? Are you guys okay? And thank you for everything you guys are doing. Just no talk about financials. Clients, I think it's a little bit different. And um, I, I think, you know, I said this to one of our enterprise clients and, um, and I think this goes to something that Andy Kurtzig has been saying, um, now is the time to kind of double down on hiring in Ukraine. I think clients who have teams in the Ukraine that have traditionally performed well for them and they are withdrawing now because of war risk reasons will be seen as the villains um, in the lens of history. And so I think, um, you know, whatever, I don't know, Andy, uh, if you have any initiatives around that, how to get more awareness about how to hire within Ukraine, I mean, I will totally volunteer for that. 
But um, that, that's my concern. All the investors have been great. Clients have had to, going back to what Andrew uh, mentioned earlier, clients need a little bit of an education process. And I do believe they are now a little bit more confident because they see a potential victory. But when it comes to data and data risk, they are, they are not so flexible. Thanks, John. Yeah, no, Andy, throwing it back to you, um, you know, that's a really interesting point about that uh, external messaging and maybe maintaining that mes messaging that, you know, Ukraine is still still open for business and you you guys are obviously uh, still open for business with your teams. Um, tell, us, tell us more. Absolutely. And, and I think Lviv IT Cluster is a great organization to help you with some of those conversations. You know, I was just there and, and my message to, to investors, customers, employees, et cetera, is you know, everything that you see on the news, it's worse than that on the east of Ukraine where the war is happening, is, you know, in, 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 in Donetsk and, and, and Luhansk and all these places. And it's better than what you think and better, better than what I thought on the west of Ukraine. And so, and happy to talk about each side of that equation. I mean, what Russia is doing is just completely atrocious to Ukraine and, and they are not following the rules. They are doing, you know, raping, terrorizing, torturing, everything that you can imagine and then bringing in, um, uh, you know, mobile crematoriums to, to clean up their mess so that they, they, you know, won't be caught. I mean, it's just completely ridiculous what, what Russia is doing on the East. And just as much the other direction, it is very peaceful for the most part on the Western side of Ukraine. I was in a town where aside from all the refugees that are there, you probably wouldn't even know that the country was at war. Ukraine is a big country. It's the largest geographically largest country in Europe. And it's got 44 million people. This is a big country, and and you know the western side of Ukraine is is largely safe. I mean, Lviv has been hit by a couple couple of bombs and, and missiles, and that's terrible. Um, so it's not completely unscathed, but it's it's largely pretty safe. I mean, I think that the 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 more common problem is the is the air raid sirens, which I don't know if they're still going on now, if they, they're off now, but they they went off when I was there as well. Um, that's a distraction. That is stressful. You know, just having your country be at war is stressful, and and that's a, a, a very loud reminder, uh, nearly every day. Sometimes more than that, um, over there. In terms of what we've been doing, we've been very focused on helping. What can we do to help? Right. That was it. Was just not only bringing supplies into the folks there, but but all of our team has been coming in Ukraine has been coming up with so many creative ways to help their country, help their economy, help their government. They're prepaying their taxes to help the government, paying taxes early. They're prepaying their bills to help their economy. They're actually paying more taxes than they, than than, than they owe to help their government. You know, they're, they're buying war bonds. They're, 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 they're setting up, um, you know, helping the, the military. They're, 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 they're helping with logistics, getting supplies to the east. I mean, they're doing so many different creative ways to help Ukraine win. It's really inspiring. And we're just so happy and honored to be able to help them with that. We've, we've, I set up a nonprofit. We've raised now over $340,000 uh, for the, the efforts in Ukraine. That's going to the Lviv IT Clusters uh, Ukraine Crisis Fund, essentially, which they're spending very well uh, on helping uh, their country win. And just so honored to be able to help. But, and, but Andy, Andy, what sort of um, feedback externally do you do you have? To, you know, are you uh, do you have incoming from uh, investors or clients or customers about uh, what's going on and what sort of messaging are you are you saying? So, so we're B two C company, so our customers. We don't have any giant customers like that, and our business is growing very, very quickly. And so, you know, we don't our invest. We have investors, but we're profitable, and so we. We, you know, we don't need to raise new funds or deal with any of that. And so, you know, we're growing, we're profitable, our profitability is growing. And so we're able to continue to invest in Ukraine and hire in Ukraine and, and do the things we need to do yeah. to, to build the business. Right. Yeah. So um, uh, to, uh, one conversation that has comes up 
um, for me is a journalist with TechCrunch. Um, and also I'm a founder of uh, TechFugees, which is a non-profit in the UK, uh, all of, uh, as a, acting as a bridge between the technology industry and the needs of, of refugees and displaced people. It is that often, um, and it, it can, sometimes there can be a sort of a, a slightly crass um, discussion that rears its ugly head about, we want to hire Ukrainians uh, to help the, uh, the the war effort, and but um, sometimes there's a slight, let's be honest, a slight oddly, slightly odd conversation really of, of like, actually, we just want to, you know, get some cheap labour, <laughs> and and so that's a difficult conversation to have, um, or you know, well, let's fly people out of the country and give them jobs in in goodness knows where. Um, it, you, has any of, have any of you guys sort of encountered any of this, this kind of a conversation that that happens sometimes? John, so let's hear from you. Well, we deal with the elite software developers, so for them, salaries just keep going up every quarter or six months, and so they've been solid. I think um, uh, to Andy's uh, earlier comment, um, what they are doing is they're taking their their significant uh, salaries and buying war bonds, paying taxes early. Um, also, and this is probably the number one source of their funds that I see, helping family and um, friends um, that aren't in the same kind of uh, financial or income category as them. Um, <clears throat> what we are seeing and what is concerning to me is the uh, there's a tsunami, Mike, of lower level support people, developers, recruiters that are now out of work. And I get these resumes, I get dozens a day. We don't have any positions for them because it's not our model to do like HTML, you know, web design work. But you, we, we have just, it feels like an entire generation that was on Upwork or working through a small, medium-sized outsourcing agency that had some stable jobs. Um, and now they're, they're displaced financially and income wise. And I, I, so that's concerning. I don't know what, you know, ideas that, you know, Andy could come up with, but, um, you know, that part of the market is, uh, is troubling. Mm. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that sounds, sounds familiar that there's a, you know, there's a, yeah, you're right at the top end, uh, things are pretty stable, but the, the sort of the mid, mid level, um, obviously mid and lower levels, there's, you know, there's, it's hard for people to connect. Um, anyone, anyone, any other thoughts on that? Um, um, uh, from anyone? Nothing to add. We're hiring, so send those resumes our way. Yeah. Right, yeah. Uh, we're hiring as well, so, I mean, I do think, I mean, what, what we just discussed is a, a fear I would have for kind of the the workforce, right? And uh, that's you know, the, the, the priority of the country today is defense and conflict driven. Um, but we just all assume that this is gonna move to GDP economy, workforce employment um, as the, the conflict winds down or evolves into the next phase, whatever that phase is. Um, and so there needs to be a lot of hard thought about how that kind of transitions or manifests into investment in the country um, with hopefully massive aid coming from overseas to invest in the country. I mean, right now that every dollar needs to go to fund a war, um, but that is going to need to transition at some point to both build infrastructure, but then also build capability to provide workers with jobs who have lost jobs through this, through this war. And if I could add one other thing, Andrew, um, you know, uh, as you, we all know, there's a significant portion of the Ukrainian IT uh, workforce that doesn't speak business level English. Mm -hmm. And for them, they had a PM that would kind of front run for them or, you know, be the bridge. Um, a lot of that has gone away. And I, I think I'm getting a lot of resumes that are in Cyrillic only. Right. So again, uh, my concern is kind of uh, focused around them. I, I don't see any easy solutions for them. Thanks, John. That's actually a great message to put out there about perhaps the support that uh, we as a technology industry could give 
uh, that's basically really quite practical uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, helping some of these um, mid and uh, uh, more lower level uh, employees um, get out there, get international work perhaps, and maintain their economy, maintain their incomes. Um, I think that's a really great message. And I think maybe it's something we could sort of even take offline at some point. But um, uh, in the sort of closing sort of 10 minutes or so that we've got left, <laughs> Let's, um, let's sort of like um, fast forward, say, to, um, <laughs> frankly, it's a bit obviously quite hard to predict the future, but um, uh, as uh, Andrew uh, pointed out, we'll, there will be a transition um, from uh, sort of the sort of full-blown hot war to, uh, you know, cross fingers, hopefully, God willing, uh, some, uh, some stability um, with, uh, I don't, <laughs> don't, don't even want to say the word Russia, to be honest with you, it's, Fills my fills me with bile, frankly, uh, uh, that country now. But the and what well the certainly the leadership. That's, let me be specific. The leadership of that country. Um, uh, so, talking say a few months or perhaps a year hence, uh, when there is some level of stability, um, where do we go next? Um, uh, what's the best way to move forward? Uh, is I mean we talked obviously briefly just a, 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 a few minutes ago about you know there are always going to be some opportunities and there is going to, the infrastructure of the company's country is going to be rebuilt. Let's talk opt optimistically about perhaps full blown full fat fiber across Ukraine, um, new, new schools around education and technical skills and, and STEM skills for the for children and for. Uh, and for teenagers, um, let's talk about um, getting the diaspora that's outside Ukraine either back into the country or, or certainly supporting externally. Um, it'd be, there is actually, let's be honest, that, you know, and let's also just acknowledge like, how astoundingly um, impressive the country has been in the gate in the in the in the face of uh, terrible odds. Um, um, Andrew, um, if I could turn to you to, uh, first of all, what's what sort of things, where do you see, you know, fast forward and sort of project yourself into the future? And what sort of reflections have you thought, thinking about that uh, on that subject? Yeah, I mean, it's it's somewhat, I mean, firstly, it's somewhat hard to think about some of the things you're talking about because there's such a pressing need right now to quote unquote, win a war, right? And, you know, the, the, the country rightfully is spending you know, most of its resources to fight that war. And when resources come in from overseas, that's the, the focus, except sort of humanitarian and uh, refugee support. Um, so so that, that's the first priority. Um, and then the second priority, once this war wanes in some way, um, will be infrastructure build, right? Houses and schools and hospitals and roads, uh, rightfully the next priority. And so if we sort of start feeling a bit selfish now around IT, it's you know, this is a strategic asset for the country that will reap huge rewards. And if you think about the progress that Ukraine's made over the last 10 years, it's been astonishing in this world of IT, the work that you know, this organization has done. And it's been hugely beneficial to the country. And, and that needs to have some level of focus and energy because it's kind of long-term strategic, long-term critical to a vibrant, exciting Ukrainian economy. Um, but there's going to be this portfolio decision at some macro level, which is kind of how do we spend money on winning the war? Then it's the infrastructure humanitarian, and then it's IT might not get the investment that it may need for long term because of the focus or priorities of the other two. And so I think you know people like us and people on this call and all the people that we represent, we need to keep banging the drums and work out how to capitalize on the moment because there is a moment here because. There's both a strategic need and imperative for the rest of the world now to invest in Ukraine and shore up this country for all the reasons from a geopolitical strategic defense set of reasons, but then also from a kind of like, it's just the right just and sympathetic thing to do, as well as the business investment there, given the talent pool. Um, so that needs to get its prioritization. What I don't know is how much prioritization it will get given those other big whelming kind of initiatives in defense, as well as humanitarian infrastructure, road building, schools, hospitals, and so on. Um, but it needs to happen because there's a, there's a, there's a long-term strategic benefit of that. And what I just can't tell you is how to think about all that given the priorities of those different buckets. Mm. 
yeah, it's very, very good, good points made there. Um, Andy Kurtzig, um, you know, I, I think um, it's a very it's a difficult parallel to, to make, but in my experience, um, you know, countries, say, for instance, in uh, emerging economies such as in Africa or Latin America, for instance, they flipped, for instance, uh, they, 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 did, they didn't do not pass go, do not, they just flipped straight to 4G networks from smartphones and, and didn't be bothered with laptops. And there's, there's a sort of tantalizing prospect uh, um, if we want to have perhaps sort of an upbeat thought, thoughts about this, that, you know, the Ukraine could become a very highly digitalized economy and it could be almost like fast forward into the future to some extent. Do you, do you feel that um, there's an opportunity here in that sense? Absolutely. And so, first of all, you know, I was just there. You look in the eyes of the, the Ukrainian people, they will win. So there's no question in my mind that they will win. There's no question in their mind that they will win. There's 44 million people who are getting supported, you know, by, by, by most of the rest of the world. They will win. It's only a question of how much death there's going to be between now and then. I mean, it's just unfortunate what Russia is doing. And when Ukraine wins, I think it's a giant opportunity to, to massively upgrade the infrastructure of the country. I mean, a lot of the country is still these old communist buildings from you know a long, long time ago. And so there's an opportunity to upgrade and get the newest, latest state of the art uh, buildings and infrastructure and, 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 and internet connections and satellite. I mean, across the board, I think that that a lot of the funding that's coming into the country now for war and, and refugee uh, support and humanitarian support is going to end up uh, turning into support for rebuilding the country, rebuilding the economy. And I think that's going to be a very good thing for Ukraine. Absolutely. Yes. And it's clear that uh, it's clear that, that that's uh, going to be on the, some of the longer term planning, uh, planning uh, ideas of uh, of the country and uh, and and its leadership uh, and what what leadership they have incredible incredible leadership in in Zelensky there um, and finally John John Sung um, Kim what what are, what are your thoughts about the the if you can cast your mind into the future for the country and its its industry and its people what are your th thoughts well Mike you know you're well known and well loved in the Ukrainian startup community. And you know, it's no secret that they really were the bright spot of the economy and, and, and many politicians uh, believe that they were you know, the future. If Europe can spend $700 million a day on Russian gas or whatever the amount is, I mean, certainly they can start a $700 million fund um, to start deploying. I mean, <clears throat> you know this better than anyone, you know, Preply, Grammarly, Ring, uh, GitLab, um, all of these came out of a country uh, that doesn't have a lot of resources and traditional funding. I, I, again, you know this better than anyone. Um, MacPaw, right? I saw you give a great speech at MacPaw's offices and, and, and what great offices. They, they don't have any investors. These people are doing this with <clears throat> like bootstrapped levels of funding. Um, I, absolutely to Andrew's point, um, the focus uh, has to be on survival and, and defense, but my God, what could the Ukrainian startup culture and community that you know, uh, what could they do with $700 million over 10 years? You're going to see some amazing things. That's actually an extremely good point. Yeah. And um, I mean, certainly at TechCrunch day by day, you know, I see funding rounds, you know, 100 million here, 50 million there. I mean, this is honestly the with, with uh, it wouldn't take that much to 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 kick kickstart and to keep that uh, economy and those uh, you know really put uh, put some petrol in the tank for the uh, for the Ukrainian uh, tech economy and the um, uh, and uh, and I think I think probably if there's anything I would like to sort of um, sort of draw from this conversation is that. Is that we should really, as an industry and as as a community, keep the message out there, keep hammering away, keep uh, telling everyone that Ukraine is open for business. Its technology industry is open for business. Uh, it's and in fact, it's it's powering ahead, as as Andy uh, said with Just Dancers, still hiring, 
still going. Um, and I think the investors, uh, as John John uh, said earlier, the investors are still doubling down on the talent in the in the country, uh, and that's definitely the case. And um, and it's it's really just about it's about us re repeating the mantra r mantra that Ukraine is open. Uh, it's ready. It's ready and waiting for investors and for partners and for uh, other businesses to get involved and maintain their involvement in the country. Uh, and absolutely, I think Andy made a very good point earlier that uh, despite what you might see in the news, the business community and the technology industry is very much alive and well in the country. And I certainly want to reiterate that. But for now, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining this conversation. It's been my privilege to support uh, the IT cluster in the IT arena and uh, the IT cluster in Lviv. Uh, and I uh, have fond memories of that city and of the country, of course, for, very, for, for obvious reasons. And I want to just say thank you very much for uh, giving us this opportunity to unpack these subjects. It was a very uh, fantastic, enlightening and detailed conversation. And I look forward to uh, uh, maintaining uh, this, uh, this, these contacts as well. And let's, let's definitely keep, keep those channels of communication open. Um, but for now, Mike Butcher from TechCrunch, that's me. And thank you very much to Andrew Brown, President and CEO of EduNav, Johnson Kim, who's the CEO and founder of JetBridge, and finally, Andy Kurtzig, who's the founder and CEO of Just Answer. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining this conversation. And from me, uh, good afternoon, good evening. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank Love you Ukraine. very much, Mike. Thank you. Love you, Ukraine. Mike Love you, Ukraine. Love you. Hello, I'm Slava. Slava Ukraine. Hello, I'm Slava. And thank you, everybody, for watching. Would you remind you that this is going to be a regular thing? And it's amazing how it's been an hour and the air ride is still out there and hasn't been uh, called off yet. So please remain. If you are in an unsafe place, please remain there. Thank you very much for listening and watching to our speakers. Uh, to our speakers, uh, we're extremely uh, they're uh, grateful because they. Uh, this is now a decisive moment for any kind of business, which will decide actually whether it is a money talk situation, or uh, you know, for some of the business out there in Russia who are still hesitating to leave the Russian market, and they will have hard time washing off their reputation in the future. But uh, you gentlemen, you are closely affiliated, or you had some roots here with Ukraine and you've stood, you've been standing, you're standing with Ukraine, thank you for that. We do hope more uh, the international support will continue and the investment in Ukraine will continue as well. Uh, and for, uh, for those of you who are still watching us, uh, there will be another talk in two weeks. Stay tuned, follow our s social media, and thank you, thank you for watching. Slava Ukraini. Slava.